More than 60 years after the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and more than 30 years after the Organization of African Unity adopted its own African Charter on Human and People's Rights, extensive human rights abuses still occur in large parts of Africa, often under the oversight of the state. Many of these violations are side effects of political instability, poverty and civil war. Reported violations include extrajudicial execution, mutilation and rape. Oil spills in the Niger Delta, the plundering of Congo's minerals and toxic waste dumping in Côte d'Ivoire with support of corrupt authorities are examples of irresponsible business practices shaping our booming economies. These observations create serious questions about the function of our own human rights legislation. With the adoption and ratification of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights in the 1980s, Africa joined Europe and the Americas as one of three world regions with its own human rights instrument. In 1987, the OAU created the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in accordance with Charter Article 30 to promote human rights and to monitor compliance by African states with their obligations under the Charter. In 1998, members of the OAU meeting in Burkina Faso by adopting the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the establishment of the African Court on Human and People's Rights voted to initiate the process for the creation of an African Court on Human and People's Rights to complement and reinforce the mandate of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. The protocol came into force on January 25, 2004, after it was ratified by more than 15 countries. The court officially started its operations in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in November 2006. One year later, in 2007, it moved its seat to Arusha in the United Republic of Tanzania. Now, after more than a decade, the court is fully operating in Arusha. But people want to learn how the African Human Rights Court complements the protective mandate of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. How does it implement its advisory and contentious jurisdiction over human rights matters? Can Africa meet the human rights challenges of the new millennium? Most Africans are eager to travel to Arusha, the seat of the court, to seek answers to these questions. But before visiting the court itself, how many people around Arusha or in any other African city or village know something about the African court? How many are aware of their rights? A random selection of Vox Pops, the voice of the people, collected in the streets of Arusha, reflect our average knowledge. This lady feels human rights are improving. She said people enjoy freedom today. In the past, people were killed without getting justice. They were denied their rights to worship or even to market their own goods. A lady who runs a store next to the court feels most women are denied their equal rights. She feels human rights abuses against women and children are of great concern. She wants to know where the people who claim to defend her rights are hiding. Many of the young motor taxi drivers feel the government has forgotten the young. Only a few of them dare to speak in front of the camera. Most fear to raise their voice in opposition to the government. Do you know what, a hu what human rights are? What the right to life, the right to go to school, to have housing, to have justice. We need the court of the woman rights because if we have a court of the woman rights, it will be very defended for us. Have you ever heard of the African courts of human rights? Their mandate, maybe it's not very clear, but I know where they are. I heard about it, but I don't know how it works. How it perform his duties, yeah, I don't know. Equipped with these questions, the concerns of the people, let's find a way to the court in the outskirts of Arusha. There's a public hearing today, a unique opportunity to observe the entire court in action. But before the real work of the judges begins, how do things happen from the beginning? I have an appointment with a senior legal officer in the court 
to learn how any citizen may redress a human rights claim to the court. Is there any specific way for someone to bring an application or can they email it, can they fax it or they have to deliver it by hand and follow procedure? You can fax it if you have got access to fax machines. You can email it if you have got access to the internet. You can post it if you can only use postal services. Or you can bring it if you want to bring it yourself in person. So it is very uh, flexible. As long as it is received here, okay. it is acceptable. You can get the application form from the website if you have got access to the internet. If you don't and you have not used the form, that does not mean that your application will not be received in the court. Okay, so I can just write a letter? You can write a letter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when an application comes in the court, they put the stamp to acknowledge receipt and the date and time. Okay. And once they have done that, they send it to the registrar immediately. The court accepts applications in any African language. This is a challenge for the continent with the highest linguistic diversity, more than 1,500 spoken tongues. For practical reasons, the court operates in four official languages of the African Union, Arabic, French, Portuguese and English. You cannot talk of an international court of justice without a language department. Uh, in the African Court on Human and People's Rights, for instance, during every session, you have uh, many interpreters who come here to work for the court. And we have judges from the different uh, parts of the continent of Africa. If a judge speaks, for instance, in Arabic, he's interpreted into English and into French at the same time. And it, it goes the same for all the other judges who come from the different uh, parts of the, of the continent. If a judge speaks in English, he's interpreted into French and Arabic simultaneously. This is the first public hearing of the court. It is a very historical moment for the court. Let's hear what they have to say. The applicant, Mr. Femi Falana, a Nigerian national and human rights lawyer, alleges he has made efforts to get the government of Nigeria to deposit the declaration required under Article 34, Subsection 6 of the Protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Since these efforts have failed, he has resorted to filing the application against the African Union as representative of its 53 member states. His application raises the issue of access to the court's jurisdiction by individuals and NGOs. It does so by challenging the legality of Article 34, subsection 6. In other words, if a country does not deposit the declaration, no individual or NGO has access to the court. In mid-2012, the African Court on Human and People's Rights ruled that the African Union cannot be sued before the court on behalf of or for obligations attributable to its member states. Despite its legal personality as an international organization, it is neither a party to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights nor to the protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Here is the registrar of the court. He is in charge of the general administration keeps a list of all cases and ensures effective communication between the parties and the court. I want to know from the registrar what happens to an application and how does the court proceed? When I receive a, a case, I send to the president uh, and I send to the judges as well. Mm -hmm. But since the president is full time mm -hmm. working here, mm -hmm. I have a direct communication with the president on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For cases that I'm not very sure yeah. whether the requirements have been met, mm. I meet with the president, we discuss it, I seek his advice mm. before I take any further action. What criteria do you use to evaluate whether a case is worthy for the court to hear or not? For example, the application must be signed 
the applicant should indicate whether they have exhausted local remedies. Mm. The applicant should indicate the evidence that they intend to bring before the court to prove the allegations. Mm. So the, the role of the registrar is to look at whether an application submitted before, uh, before the court mm. meets those requirements. Mm. The court is still facing challenges. For example, only 26 out of 54 countries have ratified the protocol so far, and only five countries have made the declaration accepting the competence of the court to receive applications directly from individual victims of human rights violations. I now have a chance to talk to the president of the court and find out why. How is the court encouraging African states to recognize the court's jurisdiction? The court has been using mainly sensitization activities mm. uh, like uh, sensitization visits uh, to the highest authority political authorities in countries which uh, have uh, ratified the protocol establishing it but which have not yet made a special declaration authorizing individuals <coughs> and NGOs to bring cases before, the, before it. Mm. Since the beginning of uh, 2011 uh, the court has started re receiving an increasing number of cases. Mm. In 2011, the court receives, received 14 cases in contentious matters mm. and two requests of advisory opinion. Mm. Did you make an appeal to the remaining African countries who have not ratified the declaration and how did they respond? Yes, of course we, we did. We always do. How they respond? Uh, generally, they <coughs> The, the member states which uh, express themselves on the issue, because mm -hmm. all, all, all of them don't uh, take uh, the floor on this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, say that they are going to consider uh, mm -hmm. making the declaration. But one, th one thing is to say that uh, you are going to consider, another thing is to, to, to do it. Yes. yes. We are on the way to Ghana for our next chance to meet with all the judges in one place. The court tries to reach out to all member states around the continent. It holds sessions outside the court in Arusha as much as possible. Ghana is one of the first African countries to attain independence and also one of the first countries to ratify the protocol recognizing the African Court on Human and People's Rights. More than that, currently, it is one of only five African countries that have deposited the declaration required under Article 34.6, allowing an individual or NGO to take a country to the African Court on Human and People's Rights. This situation places Africa in a paradox where member states of the African Union have established a human rights court but have at the same time almost closed its doors to individuals whereas by definition human rights are the rights of individuals. I want to know how an individual or NGO goes about bringing a case of human rights violations to the court. Judge Thompson on the panel explains that these NGOs must have observer status with the African Commission on Human Rights before they can bring cases before the court. You start with the African Commission on Human Rights before you can bring cases to the court. Now they are all here, the judges, the interpreters and many, many people who work for the court behind the scenes. I am determined to talk to each and every judge while in Ghana to get the full picture of what drives these people. Excellence, quelle loi établit ce tribunal Vous avez la charte qui est euh, le texte de base qui définit les droits protégés. Vous avez le protocole qui organise la cour, qui porte sa création, organise, définit les compétences et tous les autres éléments relatifs à la cour. La cour applique la charte mais aussi tout autre instrument juridique relatif aux droits de l'homme ratifié par les, par les États africains. 
The president and the vice president of the court are elected among the 11 serving judges who are nationals of the African Union member states. The judges are elected by secret ballot by the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union from among jurists of high moral character and recognized competence and experience in the field of human and people's rights. There are 11 members of the court uh, that is as stipulated under the protocol. The members are there from various parts of the continent. You are nominated by your country and, and uh, elected at the, by the Assembly of, Assembly of Heads of State of, of the African Union. But uh, you're there in your individual capacity. I'm, I am from Ghana and I'm not there to represent the interests or to represent Ghana, so to speak. I'm there to function as a judge. And uh, that is how it is in every court. People come from different parts of their country, but you're there to do justice. Excellence, qui nomme les juges de cette cour et comment sont-ils nommés? Le juge doit euh, avoir une haute autorité morale et doit euh, avoir des compétences dans le domaine euh, requis notamment ici en matière de droit de l'homme, de compétences académiques, de compétences juridiques, professionnelles, une certaine expertise. Excellence, pouvez-vous s'il vous plaît nous dire comment les cas sont gérés dans cette cour Une requête peut être introduite par voie de simples lettres dans une des langues officielles de l'Union africaine, voire dans toutes autres langues africaines. Cette requête doit parvenir au greffe doit faire, doit faire état des violations alléguées, éventuellement des moyens de preuve. Une fois que la, que la, la Cour considère qu'elle elle est en possession de toutes les informations nécessaires, elle délibère en, euh, à huis clos. C'est-à-dire que la Cour se réunit avec le, le personnel du greffe essentiel à la conduite de ses activités judiciaires et elle procède à, à la rédaction d'un jugement. Ce jugement est adopté par la Cour, il est signifié au parti, ce jugement est obligatoire, mais il est communiqué pour information au comité des ministres, au conseil exécutif de l'Union africaine, pour, euh, aux fins de, de contrôle de son application. What benefits would uh, the member states uh, receive from giving up some of their sovereignty to allow, to allow the courts to scrutinize by ratifying the protocol in the declaration? Human beings must always have an outlet, especially when it comes to their human rights. They must always feel that uh, the, the horizon is not a, a wall. They can continue on. So um, it is good to have a continental court. That would eliminate a lot of build-up of ill feeling Ill and, feeling. and that needs to come. Exactly, exactly. So uh, if you want, uh, a contented, peaceful, and progressive structure. You need to see to all these things. And it's not really giving up of sovereignty. Rather, you're reinforcing your sovereignty. Does uh, the court undertake any cases that have to do with the interpretation of a member state's constitution? Um. Not many people are actually aware of this competence, which is very important. People always think that you come to court on contentious matters. But you can also approach this court for an advice, an advisory opinion. Because a country may, for example, set up its own constitution. And then, before putting it into operation, they can approach our court to find out whether the provisions of their constitution relating to issues of human rights are compatible with the African Union's Charter on Human Rights. And then we'll advise them. And if they take our advice, if we feel that their constitution is going to be in conflict with the Charter, then they would redraft it in such a way that it would not be in conflict. Justice Augustino Ramadani, how are the decisions of this court enforced? Article 7 of the protocol uh, 
demands states, all states, when they are parties to a dispute, to comply with the judgment of the court. That is one. But not only to comply, but two, to comply within the time framework given in the judgment by the court. And lastly, to guarantee the execution of those judgments. Are there any specific programs the court is instituting in order to address gender-based human rights violations? There is a protocol on the rights of women, protocol from the Charter on the Rights of Women, which gives specific rights to women. So the court can interpret um, that protocol when um, a matter is brought before it concerning a breach of that protocol. So in that way, the court can entertain the rights of women. Could you please explain about the possible extension of the jurisdiction of the court to deal with criminal matters? What does that entail? Um, uh, there was a decision which was uh, made in um, Egypt, in Sham al Sheikh, to extend the jurisdiction of the African Court of Justice and uh, uh, human rights to deal with international crimes such as genocide, uh, war crimes, and crimes against uh, humanity. When do you think this uh, extension might happen? Is it already in the near future, in the pipeline for the near future? Is there already a deadline or a given date? Yeah, actually it's not uh, essentially, basically our role to persuade state parties to, to make the necessary ratifications. I think it will be the function of maybe the African, the African Union Commission itself or those uh, stakeholders some African states that are particularly interested, those who think that um, uh, being taken to the Hague should be avoided at all costs and that, uh, you know, possible offenders should be tried within the context of the, you know, African continent. I think those who have the task of persuading others to make the necessary ratifications to make that court operational, but I still believe it will be an uphill task. Access to the court's jurisdiction by individuals and NGOs will remain very limited until all member states have deposited the declaration required under Article 34.6 of the Protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Serious human rights abuses continue to occur on a daily basis, including gender-based violence and crimes against humanity, often unpunished in much too many of our countries. How long will we Africans wait for human and people's rights to be defended and rescued by others. What is the vision of each judge for the future of human rights in Africa? C'est de voir les droits de l'homme connus d'abord, connus d'abord, et puis respectés. My vision is that in the foreseeable future, the, there will be opportunity for as many individuals and uh, NGOs to bring human rights uh, applications to the court. I think Africa will definitely appropriate all these instruments because La pression sociale est là. My vision about human rights protection or pro promotion on the African continent is um, not a bright one. Um, I'm uh, 
pessimistic. But judging from what is happening around, especially the Arab, Arab Spring, I think there's a, a realization now that human rights must be respected and th that those people who believe that they can violate them with impunity, I think the time is over. J'aimerais en fait voir un renforcement de la culture euh, judiciaire sur le continent africain et de la culture démocratique, bien entendu. Donc il y a trois grands défis renforcer la, la culture des droits de l'homme, la culture de la démocratie et la culture judiciaire. Ce sont là les trois ingrédients qui permettraient, qui permettront à la Cour, en fait, de s'acquitter de sa mission de la, la manière la plus efficace possible. So I think the way forward for the continent would be for the court to be used as a mechanism to protect human rights, which will lead us to stability on the continent, economic development, uh, fight to fight starvation, hunger, and literacy. So, I really think that issues of human rights are at the heart of all this. The success of the African Court on Human and People's Rights depends on all of us to bring cases before the court. However, we must first convince our governments to give the court the full jurisdiction over human rights cases. Only then will the dream of ensuring human rights for all Africans become true. <laughs>